to our webinar this month. Before we get rolling, a few quick bookkeeping items. The presentation by Sanjoy will begin shortly and go on till approximately 1 p.m. Sanjoy has agreed to stay on for a bit after 1 in order to address any questions and dialogue that people may have. The slides and the recordings will be available at the end of the presentation. You can log in to your uh, Valibo account to view them. The recording, of course, will be on YouTube, and uh, you'll be able to get to it directly from the site or go to our YouTube channel at Malibo TV. Okay? Um, please keep your te telephone or microphone muted at all times. Only unmute yourself to ask questions. If you've dialed into this conference by phone, you must enter your audio pin. I can only unmute you if you do so. And for those of you who prefer to ask questions by instant message, there's a chat window. Ask your question there. Sanjoy has indicated that he welcomes questions and dialogue. So please ask questions or share your comments as you have them. I guess uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Today I'm delighted to have Sanjoy Day, a um, PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota, to talk with us about integrative pattern mining, breaking through data silos to improve clinical decision making. Sanjoy is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Minnesota. He's working in the area of data mining under the guidance of Professor Vipin Kumar. His PhD thesis is, on, is focused on mining multi-source biomedical data, such as genetic, genomic, and electronic health records. Specifically, he's working on building integrative data mining approaches by combining multiple clinical and genetic data sets, which can infer potential new knowledge for complex human diseases. Previously, he received his bachelor's of science in computer science and engineering in 2007 from Bangladesh University of Engineering, BUET. So I guess with that, Sanjoy, please take it away. Sure. Thanks, uh, Sridhar, for introducing me. So welcome, everybody, to the webinar, and good afternoon. So uh, I'll start with my initial agenda. So first, I'll describe what is the motivation behind integrating multiple types of data especially in healthcare domain. And then I'll describe a few opportunities and challenges um, that, are, that are available in these types of multi-source mining. And then I'll specifically talk about three different tasks, which are very interesting in terms of integrative mining. And that will give an idea about the specific issues and challenges and the methods. And those tasks are finding relationships across diverse data sets. And in the second task, I will also discuss about how to take prior knowledge into account to develop further model. And in the end, I'll describe briefly, depending on the time permits, how the subject heterogeneity creates further challenges for modeling diverse multi-source data sets. And finally, I'll conclude with summary and the future direction of my research. So first, Let's talk about uh, the healthcare problem in the United States. So as this graph shows, in the x-axis, it shows the life expect expectancy of the developed countries, and the y-axis shows the average um, per capita spending, which is marked by a uh, purple, purple line. So if we see here, there is a really a huge spike on the United States. That means we are spending lot of per capita income for our healthcare, which is approximately 17% of the total GDP. And that is far, far more than any other developed country. But however, in the same graph, it is showing that the life expectancy is really less. So although we're spending a lot of money in healthcare, it doesn't always mean that we are getting best healthcare. So there's re, uh, there's ended up with a really great research question where all the, physici the physicians and medical health science people, they have come to a conclusion that most of the human diseases are not so easy and they're really complex, especially in the healthcare system in the US at least. And that's why when people try to gather multiple types of data and they, there's a paradigm shift in, in last decade where most of the people try to focus on data-driven technologies rather than the prior hypothesis-driven epidemic study. So this is the age of data deluge, and a uh, lot of scientific research has been also published how the data deluge can create a paradigm shift in science and knowledge discovery. So given that, there, uh, let me also introduce a few types of data and the conditions of the healthcare data in the United States. 
So in the second graph, we are showing by red lines the, the number of entries of sequencing of genomic data. So as it's shown here, the number of sequence data are increased dramatically from 80s to later 2010, 2006. However, although we have a lot of, lot of data and sequence data that are collected, the useful knowledge that I infer from the sequence data are pretty low. And that is shown by the cyan line here, by uh, cyan dotted line. So we can see that although there are a lot of data that are collected, as time progresses, the huge gap between whatever data is collected and how much information we can get out of the data. So that has given a new research methodologies where the, where the main focus is, given this huge amount of data, how we can, how we can generate new hypotheses and then test, and finally, that can be useful in healthcare today. So now I will introduce different types of biomedical data that are available in the healthcare domain. And here I try to I will try to focus in my presentation in mostly three different domains. So the first one, which I mark as an omic data on the left side, and it, it, it actually shows different types of genetics and genomics data that are collected in last two decades. Uh, for example, this gene expression data contains the genomic information, the trans transcriptary regularity networks, and similarly, the genetics information are captured by SNPs and so on. However, there are also recently a great trend with electronic medical records, where a lot of clinical variables are, are gathered to collect the information about the patient's history, their demographics, their medications, and so on. And finally, there are also a lot of other types of data, which are which I call pathological data, and that are collected by uh, lab tests and different types of imaging, like functional fMRI and, and uh, structural MRI. So given all this data, now the question comes, how to integrate all this data together to get a better understanding? And it can meet any kind of potential healthcare problem. So the goal is, given all these types of data, can we understand the disease better? And can we make better decision making? And that decision making can be, can have a lot of applications. It can be prognosis of a disease, or it can be designing better therapeutics or interventions. And also it can be recommending new diagnosis for a particular patient, and so on. So it's much like a lot of blind people are trying to understand a, an elephant, and each of these blind people are trying to learn only a particular aspect of the elephant, which is which is given by the data, the individual. Can enjoy a question? Sure. Um, the question asks, uh, today the medical professionals are primarily consuming and using only the pathological data um, in, in their diagnosis. I'm assuming they're uh, and not using the uh, sort of the demographic, the data above, and sort of the data on your left. They're primarily using only pathological data. Right, right. But I think they also use a little bit of family history, so to determine, you know, the risk that if you are having a say a propensity of heavy, having a diabetes or a long-term disease, you know, like COPD and so on. But you were right. Most of the time, they're using the pathological data. And a very little information is being used from the genomics and the clinical variables from EMR. Thank you. Thank you. So given all these types of data, now my goal is uh, let's find, try to find what are the opportunities, what are the potential healthcare business opportunities that one can develop. So here in this figure, I try to generate this uh, phenomenon where there are even for similar groups of patients, the same drug, it doesn't work. And that has led to the area called personalized medicine, where people want to understand, even for each particular patient, what is the particular drug that suits it. So it's kind of understanding the disease phenomenon for each individual people. However, even if we use that, we can easily see, see that here, 
even that doesn't work because there are a lot of complexity in diseases like cancers and diabetes or schizophrenia. So even if we understand the genomics of a particular patient, there are a lot of adverse reaction of a drug. And that leads to an area called pharmacogenomics where people are trying to use different types of information that are available here. So basically it's like integrating different types of information that are available in the healthcare domain. Another potential application given such diverse data set is uh, trying to find the adverse event from a prognostic purpose. For example, if we have all different types of data, we can predict what the chance of a particular patient of being hospitalized in say next, next uh, 30 days or 60 days. And given that kind of predict predictive model, we can easily define different types of interventions which can prevent such adverse event. And that will reduce the healthcare cost dramatically. Also, there are, so these are, so far I have talked only mostly about direct predictive models. Uh, given different types of data, what can we do or how can we design better prognostic model for patients? But here, there are also other interesting questions that are pretty interesting for clinical domain. And uh, here I show it here by two models. So it can be, there can be multiple types of relationship, even for the same amount of data. For example, in the first, uh, first model, there is a causal model where a lot of genetics data influences the downstream clinical pathological variable, which further leads to the trait. On the other hand, the second model, where both the genomic, genomic and the clinic data are pretty independent. So given that information, a physician can go into the clinic and they can target or, or they can design better drug uh, to target the root cause. So that's pretty important. So give, you know, like uh, to understand what are the causal factors for a particular disease to design better drug, to design better intervention. And lastly, I would also mention one more business opportunities and uh, healthcare opportunities, which are pretty popular in these days, where uh, a lot of mobile and smartphone applications have been developed to monitor the patient remotely. And given those sensor data or um, smartphone apps data, one can generate, again, the risk factors for a patient being ill, say, next uh, one week or one month. So that's also another important topic, and that has a lot of potential as well. So given all these opportunities, it also comes with a lot of challenges. And I will focus on mainly the data mining challenges or data science challenges that are posed by such diverse clinical and genomic data. So obviously, the first challenge, uh, which is very difficult to handle, is how to handle different properties of data. So whenever we have diverse types of data, each data has a different property. So there can be differences based on different amount of dimensionality. There can be different formats. For example, here I am showing two types of format. One is gene expression, which is kind of more a uh, vector-based format, where each row is a patient, and columns are a vectors containing information of the genes. On the other hand, there can be some network data, like protein-protein interaction network, where uh, the relationships between the features are driven by network. So how to integrate such diverse data sets is really a big problem. Also another big problem is uh, there are a lot of unstructured data, especially in the medical records, uh, in terms of especially business, uh, physician's notes or nurse notes, which are pretty free text. And there are a lot of text mining and NLP uh, techniques has to be developed to get first uh, features out of those data sets and then integrate to the regular structural data. And the second challenge, which is also very important, is the terms called interpretability of the model. So given such diverse types of data, most of the time, um, data scientists, they only focus on the prognostic power. So given multiple types of data, let me see if I can predict better by integrating multiple types of data. That's important, there is no doubt about that. But a more interesting question is to understand what is the relationships across all these data sets. In other words, trying to enhance the interpretability of the model so that 
the domain expert can use it for clinical purpose because sometimes uh, data scientists are uh, mostly focusing on predictive power which leads to kind of a black box model where we don't understand what's going on inside the model so the interpretability is lost so I also I will discuss specifically in my later half of the presentation about this issue interpretable models where we try to integrate different type of prior knowledge, different domain knowledge to make the models uh, more interpretable. And the third issue is which is also pretty popular called statistical significance. For example, here in the uh, graph in the right side, I show two popular study by Von Weir and Wang et al. on the same cohort of uh, breast cancer data set at two different time parts. So they found that there are 69 markers from the first study and 75 from the second study. However, they are not reproducible. There are only one marker that is common between two studies. And that is hypothesized because of low sample size. Because most of the time, once we integrate multiple types of data, the dimensionality of the problem increases pretty rapidly. However, the number of samples are same. And final issue that I want to touch upon is the disease heterogeneity. So as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of heterogeneity in the patient. So each patient almost kind of a distinct type because there are a lot of uh, confounding factors like age, ethnicity, and race, which has to be taken care of in the model. So now given all these kind of challenges that the integrated mining has to focus on, I will now discuss three specific tasks that I focused on so far. Uh, so the first task that I was interested in is given multiple types of data, for example, which is shown here, we have two different types of data sets. Here, each row is a uh, sample, and these samples can be collected in a supervised setting from two different groups, like healthy and diseased people, which sometimes are level is as case control data as well. and the columns are the features. Now given these types of data, my, must, my first research goal was what are the different types of relationship that can that can cut across the data sets. And that is also pretty important as I mentioned earlier to elucidate new knowledge. And the second approach is uh, many of times there are a lot of information that are available in the domain. For example here I showed as a tree structure here which contains the relationship between two different features uh, in a hierarchical tree. So the more similar the two features are, they're towards the leaf of a tree. So that gives you the relationship that are already known from the prior knowledge in the medical domain. Now the research question is, given such kind of relationship from the domain experts, can we leverage them into our model development so that we can, un we can, we can develop more better model and which are pretty useful and more interpretable. And the third more, uh, specific task that I was focusing on was handling disease heterogeneity. So which is shown here, here there are two types of data, it's the same setting as I, as, as I showed earlier. But here in the first data set I assume it's coming from all these confounding factors from the clinical data such as age, ethnicity, and uh, gender, so on. So given that, we want to stratify the data into multiple subgroups, and we want to find different uh, homogeneous population in each of these data sets. And then building model, kind of a local model for each of these subgroups, so that uh, the confounding factor are, uh, not effect, are not affected by the model. So now I will describe uh, the tax in a little bit more detail. So the first task that I was interested in, as I mentioned earlier, was trying to find a relationship across the two data sets. So let's first define what I meant by relationships across the data sets. And there can be many types of relationships basically, but I was mainly interested on two types of relationships, and those were basically driven by the domain knowledge. because they were found in literature, especially in biomedical literature, as a very interesting one. So I'll describe now what I meant these two types of relationships. So the first one that I was interested in is called coherence type of marker. And here you can see that uh, I just represented by X and Y. 
here x is coming uh, from data set x and y is coming from another second data set. And if we look at here, each row is a sample which is coming from two different groups, cases and control. If we look at here, if I look at x separately, they are pretty discriminated because they are supported by, you know, they are represented in five cases but only one control. So that means they are very, very discriminated. Similarly, y is also discriminated. However, there is one more information that, I, that are pretty uh, useful for clinical expert is that they are correlated. And that correlation information is important, although it seems redundant, but it is important in the sense that it can lead to further analysis as a causal model. It can be that x is causing y or y is causing x. But unless we detect this type of uh, patterns, we cannot do further analysis. So this current type of marker is also important for uh, causal discovery. However, the second type of marker, which is even more interesting, is called interaction. And by interaction, I meant whenever there is two types of variable, x and y, whenever we, we, we find them together, they are more interesting than the individual. So if we look at here x, they are not that much interesting because x is represented by same amount in cases and controls. So x is not discriminated between the two groups and hence it cannot be a biomarker. Similarly, y is uh, represented in the equal amount in both groups, cases and control. So it doesn't have any discrimination power. However, if we jointly look at x and y, then we can see that they're represented five in five cases, but in no controls. So that means there is a relationship x and y, which are happening only in one group, but not in the other. And that makes it a really interesting pattern for uh, domain information. And specifically in a lot of biological uh, papers, it has been cited that actually there can be a broad spectrum between uh, coherent types of pattern and interaction type of pattern. So here in the first group, if this is x and this is y, uh, you can see that x and y doesn't have that much discrimination power, which is measured by what's ratio here. But when you combine them together, there's a huge jump, huge increase in terms of odds ratio, which corresponds to the interaction type of pattern. And on the other spectrum, we can see the redundant or like coherent types of pattern, where uh, all of them, like individual x and y, and also the joint pattern, has a similar kinds of odds ratio. So given that all these types of information, my goal was, uh, can we develop a data mining tool or data mining uh, framework that can find these two types of input pattern efficiently. So the problem is, sure. Um, so the questioner asks if the if your system actually infers the markers or is that given to you as input? So the row markers you meant? Yeah, yeah, the X and Y, the the, the integrative markers and the other marker. Uh, are, they, are they given to you as input or is, is that an output of your system? No, 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 it's given. So basically, I'll describe it in the uh, next slide in more uh, details. Okay, thank you. Uh, and okay. Uh, by the way, just uh, for those of you who are sending questions by chat, if you need to follow up, uh, please send me the follow-up question or else unmute yourself and ask the question and follow up. Thank you. Go ahead, Sanjay. Sure, sure, yeah. Just one quick thing, uh, Sridhar. I cannot see the chat box somehow. So maybe you should ask the questions on behalf of the audience. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm doing. By the way, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so basically, uh, so to describe it more, the framework, so the input is this kind of data set. So we have, suppose, three different types of data set, and it can be any types of data sets. So the X and Y in the previous slide are coming from this data set. So X can be any features from data set 1, and Y can be any features from data set 2, and Z can be any features from data set 3. So there's, those are kind of input to our framework. And the output is, can we find this type of relationship, coherence and interaction, by efficient way. So that is the purpose. Now, given that goal, I'll first try to look at some related work. Um, and most of the studies that are existing in the literature so far are only focusing on finding single features. So like one feature of X and one feature of Y together, and that's all. So they can find one, one like, you know, uh, one feature from data set 1 and one feature from data set y, x and y together. 
so they cannot find a higher order pattern. By higher order pattern, I meant there can be multiple features that are coming together from first data set X, or there can be multiple types of features that are coming from data set Y. So those are like called higher order patterns. And these types of patterns are also uh, pretty interesting in the biomedical domain because there are a lot of time, a lot of uh, correlation structure, but there can be if it is spatial data or temporal data, there can be a lot of autocorrelation among the features. So that's why it's pretty also important to look at the higher order patterns. Now given these higher order patterns, uh, there are a few studies that focused on finding such higher order pattern and mostly are coming from multivariate statistical model like CCA canonical correlation analysis or parallel ICA or the later version of DCCA. But the problem with that is that we'll show in, uh, uh, in empirical results that most of them can only find the coherence type of pattern, although not completely. I mean, they're not exhaustive enough. So they will miss some of the coherent type of pattern, but they can find um, to fair extent. However, none of this existing approach can find interaction type of patterns, which are the focus of our study. So this is the, uh, to summarize the issues with the existing techniques, first thing is that, as I mentioned, they cannot find the interactions. And uh, sorry, I think uh, the webinar is slow. Hmm. Sanjay, are you having a problem? Yeah, I think it's stuck or something. I cannot go to the next slide. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. I think something like that. Is, this, is there a problem at your end? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, again, I think it got okay. low. Okay. Are you stuck again? Yeah, I'm stuck again. Uh, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, there's some technical issues here, so I'm trying to run it again. No problem. Well, you clearly have uh, connectivity, so I'm wondering if it's just an issue of the PowerPoint. Yeah, I think it's an issue of PowerPoint because uh, I have the network for sure. Okay, so it seems better now. Uh, sorry, I apologize. So given the, uh, what are the issues, I'll summarize again. The first thing, as I mentioned, most of the existing technique can find only the interaction. They, they can only find the coherence type of pattern, but not the interaction types. And also, as I mentioned earlier, they cannot find the higher order patterns, only they, they focus is on the singleton patterns. And since that is the focus of our study, we want to find higher order patterns. That also comes with a lot of challenge in terms of computational complexities. Because as we increase the number of features more and more, and if you increase the dimension of the data, then there are exponential number of uh, such potential patterns that we have to look for. So that's why we try to develop a, an efficient com computational technique called PM in here, which is based on association rule mining framework from data mining. And we want to leverage this technique because it has some nice property of uh, pruning the search space efficiently. So here is the framework. So given three different types of data sets, it's a two-step approach. First, we want to find pattern from each individual data sets. So that can be also higher order or containing multiple features. And once we find different types of uh, features or patterns from each individual data set, we basically integrate them so that they become uh, discriminated between the two groups as well. And finally, we want to categorize them between the two groups, associative or coherence, and finally, the interactive patterns. And in each of these steps, there are a lot of uh, underlying computational issues, and we need to define a lot of uh, measures that can be used to find this pattern. So the first 
interestingness measure or first measure that we wanted to leverage is called the discrimination power. So how discriminative a pattern is between the two groups, cases and control, or healthy versus uh, disease group. So that was done by using a data mining measure called DIFSUP or differential support that stands for, and which is nothing but a simple measure which are which are the differences between the two groups. Here plus and minus represent the two groups, case and control. And SUP means the support of a feature. So given that my, my goal was first in the first step trying to find the differential support of each pattern. And this deep sub has a nice property actually. So I will describe it in this tree structure lattice. So given suppose we have like five features here coming from say two different data sets. ABC is from one data set and DE from another data set. So all possible hypotheses that can be generated are shown here. So first we can look for the individual features and then we can look for the pairs and then triplets and so on. But this diff sub has a nice property called anti monotony property and it is working like that. So I'll explain it here. Suppose AB is not discriminative enough. Then with this property we can show that none of his super patterns are interesting as well. So depending on this property we can easily prune the search space pretty efficiently. And once we have search, uh, one, once we have pruned out all these non-interesting patterns or the patterns that are not discriminative, the next step is trying to find these two, these two types of relationships that we are interested in. So first, we defined a measure to find the coherence type of pattern. And similar, we wanted to also find interaction type of pattern depending on how much improvement of the discrimination power we had from joining versus uh, in separation. So depending on these two types of measure, we, we wanted to further define the two different types of patterns that we anticipate. Now I will show uh, an evaluation approach for synthetic data. So here, suppose we have two different data sets, synthetic data sets where each row again are samples and each columns again are features. So I'll show two types of approaches. Uh, first, let's look at coherent type of pattern. And again, this is a simplistic case just for illustration purpose. For uh, we went through a lot of evaluation with uh, many types of such synthetic data set and we wanted to show how our method, which is PME here, can perform in compared to the baseline method like CCA and ECC. So clearly you can see here, this is a coherent type of pattern which is marked as P2 here because they are mostly correlated and uh, they're discriminative as well between the two groups. So we can see here, um, most of the techniques like this baseline technique CCA and PMN can find it, although some of the other techniques like DCCA can miss it. However, most interesting things is such interaction pattern where which is shown here, is here. so we can clearly see that there is a correlation of this two features P5 in disease group, but not in the healthy group. So this is the interaction types of pattern that I defined earlier. And you can clearly show that, see that from here, none of the baseline method can find it. So this is the potential um, property of our new design algorithm. And also, finally, we wanted to leverage this technique into several real world data sets. So I'll show you some results on some real uh, schizophrenia data sets that was collected by some of our collaborators from Department of Psychology and Psychiatry. And that was done on one, 170 schizophrenia patients containing three different types of data. So the first data was collected from 162 SNPs containing a genetic information. And the second and third data set contains functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which are kind of imaging techniques to gather the functional and the structural information of brain. So given these types of data set, we apply the same framework, and it turned out some very interesting results, which are shown here. So here we try to visualize all the patterns that are found by this technique, and each node here represents a potential feature, which are coming from three different data sets, and they're marked here by three different colors, basically. And a connection means there is a pattern. So there is a kind of a correlation or coherent structure. 
and it turned out very significant because uh, some of the associations that are shown here were pretty novel that were not discussed or not discovered earlier. So I'll summarize our technique again. Um, as I mentioned earlier, PM in this framework can find two different types of relationship and the novelty here, it can prune the search space efficiently based on uh, some association mining framework and can find higher order patterns. However, there's some potential uh, future work that we can, uh, we can undertake. So first thing is that we found that our proposed measures are mostly applicable for binary data sets because it is really hard to define such kind of measure for real value data set. So in future work, we want to leverage that and design a better uh, measure for finding uh, in, in generic setting from any types of data. Okay, so I will now also discuss a little bit about the second topic, which is pretty interesting as well. So, so far I discussed what are the type, different types of relationship that can be present between the two, two data sets. Now, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. yep, Sridhar? Yeah, the question yeah. asks, uh, what particular data mining approach or algorithm are you currently using? For the first task? Yeah, what particular data mining algorithm or approach are you using? That's the question. So for the first task, I used uh, association rule mining framework. Basically, um, it's, a, it's a generic framework that was proposed uh, maybe two decades back now. But there are a lot of extensions of that framework uh, depending on the study and goal. So I wanted to leverage that framework. However, I designed different types of measures and uh, different types of pruning technique that, that I mentioned earlier. So it was a kind of designing also a new technique uh, or extending the association rule mining framework. But the whole methodology was based on the basic technique called association pattern mining or association rule mining technique in the data mining domain. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'll proceed now on tax two basically. So here we have seen similar setup, similar types of data from two different groups and from many different types of uh, diverse features. Now, in addition, we have a kind of relationship among those features, which can be given by tree structure or any other structure. But here, I focus mainly on kind of a tree structure that is available in the data. So let me first, and that was, this task was mainly done on electronic health records and it was coming from multiple dimensions. So let me first describe the data. So here, there are these patients who, these are like elderly patients from Center of Medicare and Medicaid of government agencies. And it was a large scale data containing almost quarter million patients' records. So this data set um, was pre-processed and cleaned, and it contains several dimensions. So when a patient was admitted to say home healthcare, the first thing it was collected was uh, their pathological variables, kind of an admission assessment survey. So there are several questionnaires to ask and to assess their pathological, their pain, their um, activity of daily living, and so on. And in addition, we also collected the billing codes from the claims data for the same patient. And that gives the diagnosis codes in terms of ICD-9. And given all this data, at the time of admission, our goal was we also has uh, the discharge data for the same variables. So the goal was what are types of pattern or what are the groups of patients that are more likely to improve if they are going through the home healthcare so that we can make better clinical decisions. So it's kind of finding subgroups of patients based on the admission information so that we can better design the interventions for that particular group. So given this different types of data. Sanjoy, question. Sure. Hello, Sanjoy. Hello? Yep, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, the questioner yes, uh, yeah. Asked, yeah, did you do the pre data processing, like handling missing data or bad data? Yes, yes, yes. That's a good question actually. We did a lot of pre processing. 
and actually it uh, turned out that uh, since it is kind of uh, a, a retrospective study, kind of a secondary analysis of EHR data, so we have to do a lot of pre-processing, kind of missing value removal, or even like feature extraction. There are a lot of uh, redundant features or irrelevant features which are not useful. So we have to do that, and it took really long time, approximately like five to six months, just to get uh, the data cleaned. Yes, Thank so you. given uh, this data, now as I mentioned earlier, the important research question was, yeah, thank you. So given these types of data, the important research question that I was interested in, what are the groups of patients that are likely to improve? And it can be any types of outcome. It can be improvement of ambulation, it can be improvement of, say, their activity of daily living, and so on. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my focus was not only to predict the improvement or outcome, like uh, the traditional uh, predictive models. But in addition, I wanted to make the model more interpretable so that we can find more clinical information or usable information. So here I will describe it by two groups. Suppose I, I my, my method finds uh, a group here, a ICD-9 group here, representing a coherent group of patients. And we can see here there are different codes here. So, and these codes are neurological manifestation, dementia, Alzheimer, and cerebral degeneration. This is a more kind of a very coherent group, and that is very interesting because it's more interpretable. And probably there is an underlying phenomena which are coming as a like neural disorder. So, if I show this group one to a clinician, they are more interested to find group like this versus the second group because in the second group. It's pretty heterogeneous codes that are coming together. So although the group two may be very, very predictive, however, it doesn't give much sense to the domain expert. So basically, my goal was trying to bias our model more toward group one so that it becomes interpretable. So I'll show here these uh, two objectives. So basically, interpretability and the prediction power, they are two orthogonal dimensions. So as I mentioned here, the group one is very, very interpretable. However, it might not have good predictive power. On the other hand, G2, uh, are the other type of extreme, where it is very predictive, but it's very little information. So my goal was trying to find patterns. These are the ideal types of groups, where it is both predictive and also interpretable. And to do that, as I mentioned earlier, Hello, we have, yes. yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. So yeah. based on the yeah, so based on the training, so uh, what is the size of the training data set you are using? What is the size of the training data sets I'm using here? Yeah. Yes. Um, so it was most uh, like the all of the patients was in together 260,000. So it's approximately so quarter million. Yeah, but we did kind of a cross validation study, so it was kind of. 10 fold cross validation. So, for training, approximately 90% of these quarter million records are used, and for testing, we use the rest of the 10%. Sure. So, uh, what is the criteria that you choose this uh, data set? Do you have any criteria, or, just, or you just choose the data set randomly, or what are you doing? Uh, these data sets mean this, uh, all these diagnosis groups and the admission assessment survey? Yeah, I mean, I assume you get a lot of data, then how did you pick up the training data set? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, that was where the expert is from our collaborator team. So we used to work with a lot of collaborators who are shown here, Bonnie Wistra. She was, uh, she was from Department of uh, Nursing, and there are also like School of uh, Healthcare Informatics, and they really guided us to select the features, to select the samples, but most of the time we didn't remove any of the samples because the quality of the data was, in terms of samples, were pretty good. But most of the time it turned out that some of the features are not irrelevant and we just remove them. Uh, and it was an iterative approach. Sometimes we talked to our collaborators and they gave a lot of input. Sometimes uh, Basically, you know, we did kind of uh, data science tools to do feature selection, kind of statistical text or uh, predictive 
analysis on a, like all this refer model or uh, feature extraction method to see what are the features that are most uh, useful. So it was it was kind of an you know iterative approach. We used both domain knowledge and also uh, feature selection technique together. Okay. To see yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Just one more. Yes. Um, uh, you know, you have about ten or twelve minutes left, uh, so I, you could take the questions at the end, or there are, there's a, one more question that's come up. Do you want to take that now, or do you want to finish up and then have the questions at the end? No, sir. No, no. I would like to take it. I think I'm pretty good. I'm sorry. No, I think I'm good in time, so yeah, I can take the question. Yeah. So the, I mean, you talked a little bit earlier about the pre-processing time. Uh, you know, I think that was Shuping's question, the pre-processing time for the data. The questioner asks, is this kind of pre-processing time normal for most of your data sets? You said it took about four to yeah. six months to clean up the data, right? Yeah, most of the time the medical records are very, very noisy and it contains a lot of missing values. So it contains a lot of time to pre-process. Actually, um, in our lab we had some undergraduate students to do that. So uh, to answer your question, yes, a lot of time for, uh, spent on pre-processing data, but some of the genetics data are not so bad. So uh, medical records are very, they take contents most of the time, but genetics and pathological variables, they are relatively clean. Yeah. Does it answer the question? Yes, thanks. Yeah. So I'll probably try to finish up in like 10, 15 minutes and probably we can take questions. The, the later. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I'll proceed from here. So as I mentioned here, I'll again uh, describe the goal here. So the goal here, trying to find both predictive and interpretable uh, groups or you can say pattern. And how to do that? Now this is the question and here comes the proposed method. So suppose we have these types of data. Again, it's the same data sets types of X and Y where X contains the diagnosis codes in terms of ICD-9, and Y contains different types of pathological, demographics, uh, their socio-demographic variables, and so on. So given these two data, X and Y, uh, we want to leverage also the third type of data, which is called the prior medical knowledge. And that gives kind of the relationships between these ICD-9 diagnosis codes. So given these three types of data, I proposed a framework where all these three types of information can be gathered together to find better groupings of patients. So suppose I have this X and Y together. The, I'll first talk about the baseline model, which is called canonical correlation analysis, because that's uh, mostly used for integrating data. So suppose I have X and Y, and I don't have any prior knowledge. Suppose this is the baseline model. So given this data x and y, I want to find a feature transformation vector wx and wy, um, which are the canonical coefficients, and such that whenever I transfer that uh, the x or whenever I project this x in wx dimensions and y in wy transformation, the correlation between these two components are maximized. So that's basically the goal of canonical correlation analysis. So intuitively, it's pretty simple. So in, from data set X, we want to try to find a component here which contains uh, coefficients of multiple variables from X. And similarly, we want to find a component here from Y which contains a grouping of multiple features here, such that they are maximally correlated across the two data sets. So that is the baseline method that we, uh, uh, we work with. And then we have the third data sets which are the relationship across the features. So our proposed method was uh, how we can leverage this information that are available in terms of the relationships of these diagnosis codes into the model. So to, to do that, we proposed a similarity measure metric called H matrix, where it contains the pairwise similarity between the two diagnosis groups. And that is dependent on how, how similar or how many depth of the tree they have to travel to make the common ancestor. For example, here, if we look at these two groups, which are pretty close to the leaves, they have really similarity. However, if this, if I take two disparate groups, which are not that much similar, we can see that their common ancestry in the tree is towards the root. 
So that by that way, we define this measure H, H matrix, which is kind of a similarity matrix. And based on that, we modified this optimization framework so that uh, we can we can trade off between the data driven similarity and also the you know prior knowledge driven similarity. So this is always a trade off, and that trade off is done here by parameter lambda h, which is kind of a model parameter that you have to learn from the model. And that lambda h, whenever it is lambda h is zero, we can see here if it is lambda h is zero, so then we don't have any prior knowledge. That means it exactly to the previous method of uh, CCA, like the baseline model. But whenever there is a lambda h um, which goes between 0 to 1, uh, it tries to trade off between these two types of models, which is data driven versus prior knowledge driven. So, given these two types of data, once we have the data, we actually have to evaluate some way um, the opt in groups. So as I mentioned earlier, this lambda h, there is a parameter which was selected by a cross validation technique. Um, but more interesting thing was how to evaluate this pattern. So whenever I said interpretable, whenever we look at pattern, it seems pretty intuitive to have uh, to to think about whether it is interpretable or not. However, if we show that patterns to a domain expert, most of the time it is subjective. And there is no kind of proper way or a systematic way to measure the interpretability. So in this project also, we proposed a metric called I-score based on the literature search of the found patterns. And the idea is very simple here for I-score. It's like, suppose I find a pattern with different types of diagnosis scores. Now we want to see how many times these different diagnosis scores co-occur in a medical article in PubMed. So it was done by generating an automated search in PubMed articles um, and trying to see how many times they are found together versus separate. And once we have these types of measure, we can show here uh, our proposed method, which is on the right side of the graph, and uh, which I called uh, SHCCA. We have increased the interpretability by a huge amount from the baseline model. So on the left side, it shows the baseline models of CCA, which shows that the patterns that are found in the baseline models are not that much interpretable. On the other hand, on the right hand side, our method which, which takes the prior knowledge into account becomes really, really interpretable. And I can show you also uh, some of the results that are found from these real world data sets. So here, these are like the first component that was found in the data set X and Y here. And we can see that all these variables that are all the features that are selected by this model in the first component, they're very, very homogeneous. They're all coming from some uh, mental health or neurological disorder variables. Similarly, the second groups, which are pretty interesting too, and that were coming from um, the patients who have gone through some kind of surgery and who have some prior history of uh, pressure also. So yeah, in, in summary, I would like to say we proposed a framework to take the prior knowledge into account um, so that we can develop not only predictive models, but also more interpretable models. And to measure the interpretability, we also proposed a metric depending on literature search. Uh, and it turned out that that metric was really useful to measure some of the patterns that we have found. In terms of future work and limitations, yeah, there are a lot of work that can be done. For example, uh, the way to measure the I score or interpretability measure was very simple. And there are a lot of scope to improve it in terms of how to search the PubMed articles, what types of articles we should look at, and so on. So that can be done as well. And similarly, there are other types of relationships besides this tree that I have used so far. So there are other types of uh, already known medical knowledge which can be further included in the model and that we want to do in our future work. So since we ha I don't have much time, I'll probably skip the third task, which is a uh, subject heterogeneity. And uh, I'll summarize most of the tasks that are I have presented somewhere. So there are three specific tasks basically that I focused on in my research. So the first one was 
given different types of relation data sets, what are the relationships that can be present? And specifically, we looked at two types of relationships, interactions and cohorts. And those are driven by domain knowledge. And the second task, uh, in addition, sometimes we have uh, some prior knowledge that are available from medical domain. And we wanted to leverage that information into model development so that it not only develops a predictive model, but also an inter interpretable model. And that can be useful for domain experts. And the third tracks, which I didn't get a chance to explain um, more. So um, briefly, it's like trying to find more heterogeneous, uh, homogeneous patients. So a lot of times, there are a lot of heterogeneity in the patient groups. And we wanted to, we wanted to remove such kind of heterogeneity from the data. So the idea is, instead of building kind of a global model that looks for all the samples together, we wanted to break it down in further small, small models depending on other information. So that was the intuitive idea. And in all of these tasks, I wanted to contribute both in data science and also in the healthcare domain. So now let's also focus on the broader challenges that I initially discussed, which are the common challenges in integrated biomedical domain. So the first property is, uh, first challenge was different types of properties of the data. And the second was interpretability and statistical significance and disease heterogeneity. So in the three tasks that I described so far, I mostly focus on the in how to increase the interpretability of the model and how to handle the disease heterogeneity. So in future, I want to touch upon the two other challenges that I left with. Uh, specifically, how to handle different properties of data. For example, there are a lot of unstructured data from clinical notes and physicians' uh, prescriptions, sometimes which contains a lot of information. And a lot of techniques like natural language processing or text mining can be developed to extract features uh, from such unstructured data. So there are a lot of scope of research in that dimension how to integrate those unstructured information with pretty standard structured information. And also there can be different types of properties based on the format. Some can be graph-based, some can be vector-based, some can be of different types, binary, continuous. So those all things have to be taken into account. And another further dimension that I really interested in is how to take the temporal dimensions into account. So these days, there are a lot of medical records that are being collected over time, where each patients are uh, monitored over a particular time, especially in ICU or chronic diseases. Where, uh, yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah, uh, since it's only one o'clock, we'll probably be losing a lot of people. So can I just quickly interrupt? Uh, uh, you, you know, I think you're going to stay on for a few minutes after one. But for those of you that need to leave, uh, thank you so much for participating. Uh, when you leave, you will actually get a seven-hour um, survey. Please do fill that out because that does help us improve our uh, seminar offering. So uh, you know, give me your comments and thoughts about what we can do better. Um, and our next seminar is going to be on July 24th, um, when we're going to be talking about uh, GPUs and performance and applications. Um, and that's also on Friday, July 24th at noon Pacific. So I guess uh, those that need to leave can do so. But Sanjoy, please continue. And then we should wrap up with final questions. Yes, yes. Thank you, Sridhar. I think we are almost pretty close. I'm just finishing one minute. So yeah, so these are like another dimension about how to take the temporal information into account and how to extend all the model, models that I developed so far uh, to handle such kind of uh, temporal longitudinal data. And the further dimensions can be um, increasing the sample patients, like the patient size. Uh, for example, there are a lot of big data that are being available day by day from medical domain. A lot of big data solutions can be leveraged. And that can increase the statistical significance um, pretty dramatically. Also, there are the other types of data from uh, genomics, genetics, and medical networks. For example, social networks or sensor networks. And they also contain sometimes rich information. For example, uh, a patient might uh, share the information in social networks like Twitter or Facebook. And those information can be also integrated with the traditional data 
to track the spatial temporal pattern of the disease. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my advisors from Department of Computer Science in Minnesota and also a lot of collaborators that are that I was fortunate enough to work with and without them no data will, will be uh, collected and none of this research will be done. Uh, so with that I will thank you all for attending the webinar and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much Sanjoy. Uh, folks uh, please send me your questions um, and uh, you know meanwhile as I'm waiting for questions I guess uh, there are a couple that I can actually begin with. I guess, uh, you know, Sanjoy, one of the things that you talked about was, uh, you know, the, the, the key to your system is obviously a lot of domain knowledge from medical professionals who sort of identify some of the key features in the disparate data sets and then your algorithms to sort of uh, figure out the correlations and what actually discriminates and so on and so forth. I guess the interesting question nowadays is as the amount of data increases, especially as genetic data and some of the other data comes in, um, is it, is it always a given that uh, clinicians and uh, medical professionals will know what the interesting feature, uh, features are that they need to evaluate? In other words, if you don't know the features, uh, how, do you, how do you make such a system work? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so may, uh, just to make one thing clear, so most of the methods here I applied, for example, I was showing the data set at one, data set two, so here, definitely, there are some pre-processing done based on domain knowledge. But um, all of the techniques that I applied so far, we didn't end up with the domain knowledge completely. So we, we removed some of the features that are completely redundant or doesn't contain information. But once given the data set, the goal was, what are the new hypotheses that we can develop? And that can go beyond the existing knowledge as well. For example, in the first task, or even in the second task, I was showing the patterns, like the interactions and coherence type of pattern, and most of the time those were not available or those were not found earlier in the literature. So it's kind of a trade-off, you know. Uh, sometimes you know, there's quite a bit of background noise for those of you who are unmuted. Can you please mute yourself uh, so that uh, there's less disturbance? So go ahead, Sanjoy. Yes, and most of the time, um, we have to rely a little bit of, from, from the domain expert and collaborator just to get the idea of the data. But it doesn't mean that we always uh, you know, use the people that they So that's the beauty of data mining and data science techniques. Because given any types of data, the method or the technique can itself can tell which features are important and which features are interesting. But we, we consult with the domain expert because at the end of the day, whenever we find a pattern, we need to validate that. And to validate that, um, we need experts who can say or who can, who can guide, guide us to determine what are the patterns that we have found are significant or not significant. Okay. Yeah, okay. so I think, yeah. That's a difficult way, actually. It's a, there is no solid answer to that. It depends on the goal, and it's an iterative process. Sometimes we rely very little on the domain expert if the data is clean. But if the data is not clean, then we have to take some information from them about how to process the data. OK, thanks. Um, let's see, another question. Um, are there any drawbacks in your approach? Yeah, I think each of these uh, specific tasks, uh, I mentioned a couple of limitations and future work. Uh, so yeah, definitely one one drawback, or I would say it's not a kind of drawback, but it's a limitation uh, for the current approaches, is that most of the techniques that I use so far are kind of cross-sectional studies. So they cannot take the temporal dimensions of patients into account. So most of the time, they just look at kind of a snapshot of all different types of information that are available for a particular patient. But many times, as I mentioned earlier, uh, especially these days, like in the last uh, few years, a lot of ICU data is coming up. And all this data has rich information about uh, how the pathological variables or how the patient's medications are changing over time. So those information can be taken into account. Uh, yeah, the first thing, yeah. Uh, 
in terms of limitation I can also tell the specific feature work for the each task um, I think I covered mostly during the presentation but for the first task basically as I said uh, it's, uh, it's not pretty generic to contain or to process any types of data so that's basically a huge challenge and that can be further extended depending on what types of properties of the data they are so yeah all these methods are uh, faces a lot of challenges if the properties of the data or the format or the types of the data are pretty different then we need to somehow pre-process them or somehow incorporate into the model um, so that's another future work okay. uh, another question that's come in is were the data collection techniques changed based on the predictions from your model so data collection technique yes I actually um, sometimes whatever features we find it turns out that maybe it's not clinically useful to use because we don't find we, like you know, sometimes we don't have an independent cohort or independent patient samples that are collected so that whatever results we are finding can be tested on an independent data set so there's a kind of uh, a drawback however many times it turns out that we can at least prune out some of the samples collection techniques so we can at least tell that okay these types of features or this type of pattern doesn't make sense so better we should not collect them so that type of kind of a negation knowledge we know that these are not useful as opposed to whatever is useful because if we want to say these things are useful we need a lot of confidence and a lot of validation on independent data sets however to make sure that the things are not useful is kind of easier thing to do so a lot of the techniques that we find out turned out that we can uh, generate hypotheses or generate new hypotheses that can be further useful for pruning out such data connection technology okay um, I guess one more question that's come in you know you're working with um, both Mayo Clinic and uh, the University of Minnesota Medical Center uh, is there any uh, you know algorithms or uh, ideas from your research that sort of making its way into how those uh, uh, how the uh, that, that has modified the practices of those uh, medical uh, groups well yeah that's a good question basically there's the end goal but uh, as I said earlier it's really hard to use them in clinical practice because once we do some research and we find that okay these things are pretty useful many times it happens that all these results are biased to a particular data set or a particular cohort that are collected so unless all these results are really well validated on a, say an independent data set or independent cohort or in a different time point um, it's really hard to generate kind of confidence to use them in clinical practice so I would say this is kind of a first step we generate a lot of hypotheses we, we generate a lot of patterns that are useful and many times the domain experts they just take those patterns and do further analysis or design further study so that uh, all these patterns can be validated so yeah I think in terms of that way we are helping and we are trying to reach there but not yet so we are trying to reach there so that it can be used in clinical practice uh, by you know in future but yeah I think right now it's too early to come to a conclusion that these things are pretty useful and that can be used in domain because uh, oh, yeah, even in like, the United yeah, States sure. yeah even in the United States um, there's a statistic that I was reading only 20 percent of the clinics and hospitals in the United States really contains electronic medical record rest of the 80 percent are still on paper format so we don't have even the data so far so I think maybe in 10 years or so uh, the trend is there and more and more data and hospitals and clinics are trying to adopt the electronic versions and generating data and storing them nicely. So yeah, hopefully they will be useful. So I guess uh, 
Folks, we have reached the end of our time. Uh, I know, uh, Sanjoy, you need to run as well. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to give us a talk. Uh, and folks, as uh, inconsistent with pre prior practice, um, because this is a webinar and lots of you are attending from all different parts of the United States and indeed the world, uh, let's all, um, I've unmuted everyone, so please, all of us, uh, let's extend Sanjoy a warm up applause. And uh, I guess we do that through a virtual clap. So Sanjoy, here we go. Thank you, Sanjoy. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Sudar, and yeah. also all the audience uh, who had the patience to listen to the seminar webinar. Yeah. Uh, so, folks, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Sanjoy. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all on uh, Jan on uh, June uh, July 24th uh, for a talk by Lackey Shah on uh, latest applications, you know, using GPUs. And uh, please do fill out the webinar survey. The slides, the Sanjoy slides, and the talk uh, should be on YouTube shortly, as well as the site. So thank you, and see you all on July 24th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.